Well, manga uh, can be defined in many ways, but if we think of manga the way most Americans do as comic books, not just newspaper comic strips or cartoons, but as comic books, um, they really are a um, fusion, I think, of Japanese traditional art, line art that entertains with the American grammar. And the grammar was the, that was developed in the United States consists of what we're so familiar with now and people can read with no second thoughts at all, and that's being able to break down time into sequences with panels usually, and then have dialogue in the form of word balloons. So modern manga are really a fusion of these two elements, I think. It's a traditional love of line art and also art that entertains, is humorous, often bawdy, uh, and fusing that with um, the format that was imported from the United States. And before that, the format for cartooning that was imported from Europe. Osamu Tezuka was born in Osaka, um, and he grew up, and he was lucky he wasn't drafted into the army, partly because he was able to get into medical school. And he began drawing, actually, before the war ended, he was drawing for himself, really, because he was unable to publish anything when he was a young man, uh, especially when he was in high school. Uh, and he, he took elements that were already in existence in Japanese comic strips, newspaper comic strips, and also comic books. And he also incorporated elements from American animation. And he began creating very long stories. So he believed that you could use the format of comics, comic strips, comics, to create a story about anything. And it could be like a novel or a film. And that's, I think, really the big innovation in Japanese manga, as we, as we think of them generally. Um, because the manga today can be used to depict anything. There are manga today in Japan that are sold that tell you how to pay your taxes. Uh, there are manga that explain the government system. There are manga that explain religion. There are manga that will uh, tell you how to use a lawyer. Uh, you can do anything with manga. And that's really the big innovation in Japan, I think. And it was a way of really decompressing storylines using a lot more pages. Animation really is what went global first. Uh, the manga did not go global at all until 2002. <laughs> Uh, when I translated the whole series, but, but that took a long time. Uh, the, the animation appeared in the United States on TV in 1963, uh, and I had nothing to do with that. I was only 13 at the time. <laughs> but uh, that was the first 30-minute TV animated series that was created in Japan. And there was a huge amount of pride involved in creating that in Japan, and they were also able to create it in a very low-cost low way using what's called limited animation, which had already been done in the United States in some ways, but it became the basis for Japanese TV animation. And that involves concentrating on storylines and character development as opposed to movement. So that's one thing I think that fans like about Japanese anime, whether they're in the United States or Europe or Asia. There's often a wonderful, complicated storyline, uh, and it's very realistic. Sometimes the heroes will die. Uh, sometimes the little guy wins. Uh, sometimes, often, the, the protagonist is a young woman. Uh, they're very fresh. And uh, I, I think that appeals to a lot of people in the United States and Europe and also Asia. They're fresh, and, and, and people see that. I think that other media would deal with the same sub-communities, but probably not at the same level, because one of the one of the hallmarks of manga is that they're fairly easy to create. One person can create a manga. Unlike a, a TV series or a movie, you don't need a huge budget and you don't need a staff of hundreds of people, uh, which creating a theatrical feature would, would require uh, maybe thousands of people and, and maybe millions of dollars. A manga can be created if you have a really good idea and you don't even have to be a good artist. You just have to have an original style and original ideas. So that's, I think, one of the ways that, uh, w one thing that distinguishes them. They're, they're very accessible, and it meant, meant that also 
they can be created in huge volume. So there are far more works uh, in manga in Japan than you would find, uh, for example, comics in the United States or Europe. There's vastly more, and they can represent very niche subjects and very niche groups. So you might have uh, not only manga for uh, junior high school kids, but specifically for males, females, high school kids, males, females, college, males, females. They're usually segregated by gender, but they can be very specific, and they can be uh, about mahjong or pachinko or uh, subjects that we're not even familiar with in the United States. And I think they're also, when they go global, uh, they're fairly easy to localize. That's another thing. Um, it's fairly easy to localize anime. You just have to dub it, or you can use subtitles. It's not that difficult. And the manga themselves now are easier and easier to localize. Uh, the technologies that exist, Photoshop and cheap printing. So. It's a fairly diffusible medium, not to mention the fact that uh, most anime and manga are also av available as pirated editions today, too. <laughs> One thing I find fascinating is that all, most of the major cities now have uh, manga and anime conventions, which are attended by huge numbers of young people, um, sometimes 35,000 in a three-day period or even 50,000. For many of these young kids, it's, uh, I shouldn't say young kids, because some of them are adults. Uh, some of them are 40-year-old men or women dressing up as uh, Sailor Moon characters or Pokemon characters. Um, it's, a, it's a place where they feel that they can be, I think, free and express themselves in a different way. And uh, you'll find, I think, that in some of the conventions today, people are actually attending, not because they read the manga or they watch the anime, because they like to dress up, uh, what's known as cosplay costume play, which actually is partly imported from the United States and masquerade events in, in comic conventions. That's become huge in the United States and a, a lot of people go to conventions just to enjoy their cosplay. And you'll see people walking around in their favorite characters' outfits and um, enjoying the stories and meeting up with other fans of particular characters or series and that sort of thing. So there's, people are enjoying them in a variety of different ways. VHS, of course, made it possible to sell Japanese anime to a much broader market and also into the United States. And the illegal copying, of course, of shows using VHS ironically helped because it created demand. You had more people exposed to anime and they wanted to see more. And even if they're illegally copying it and watching it, then they might go out and buy the, the, the VHS that they really like or the manga they really like. And that is true uh, even today to a certain extent. The DVD market is almost dead, I think, or it's on the verge of dying. But um, the illegal piracy, which is prevalent, unfortunately way too prevalent, of both manga and anime, has had this effect of diffusing and creating easier access to the stories. So it's helped the industry and it's hurt the industry at the same time. Uh, we went from VHS and DVD now it's, of course, streaming, and both manga and um, anime are, are being streamed. And there are companies that are trying to uh, monetize uh, new technologies and prevent piracy. In Japan, there are certain manga magazines now that are, are released in English and Japanese at the same time and streamed. And that helps prevent piracy because the pirates, or the what were called scanlators, for manga at least, are not likely to spend a lot of time on something that's fairly easily available at a reasonable price. Sort of like iTunes did with uh, to resist the technologies that were were popularized with Napster and, and, and really created a problem for the music industry. So people are coming up with new ways of distributing both anime and manga in ways that can generate some revenue and not be pirated. Well, right now, um, actually expanding pop culture and marketing pop culture is a national strategy. So <laughs> um, it's part of the Cool Japan strategy, which is an official policy of the Japanese government, uh, at least the, the party in power right now. So there is an attempt on the part of Japan to use what's known as soft power and also contents, contents industry. 
uh, as a way of generating um, capital. Uh, so as the manufacturing industries have de declined in Japan, there's a need to emphasize uh, industries and, and uh, things that can, can generate um, capital. So manga and anime and games in particular are, are uh, something that a lot of emphasis has been put on in the last 10 years. And of course, Pokemon Go is uh, making people very happy right now, <laughs> especially in Nintendo. <laughs> They're overjoyed. They're uncorking the champagne right now.